Hey, welcome back to Antisocial Studies. I'm Emily Glanklair. Today in our teacher talk, we're gonna be talking about unit six, which is, I think, my favorite unit. Yeah, I think I'm ready to declare that unit six is my favorite unit. So what is in this unit? We're really talking about imperialism, but we're just essentially talking about the 19th century. So one, make sure that your kids understand that unit five and unit six are talking about the same time period. Although if you wanna kind of explain it to kids this way, unit five is a little bit more about the first half, right? You're talking 1750 to you know, 1825 or so with all the different revolutions. And then unit six is focusing a little bit more on the second half, but I always find this is when it starts to be helpful to give kids dates, not necessarily to memorize every single one of them, but just to anchor kind of where they're talking about. My other tip for that is that, especially if you're teaching US Americans, this is a, a good time to start referring to events in American history just to help them get a sense of where they are. For example, if I'm talking about the Meiji Restoration or the Emancipation of the Serfs, I like to point out that all those things happened at the same time as the American Civil War, right? So it's like Alexander's freeing the serfs, uh, the Meiji are sort of abolishing the samurai class, among a lot of other things, and the United States is emancipating its slaves all in the same five years, which is really interesting. And kids normally get their minds blown, like, whoa, Meiji Japan and Abraham Lincoln existed at the same time. So um, on the AP exam, this unit is called Consequences of Industrialization. I think the reason why they didn't call it the age of imperialism is really telling. They don't want us just to focus on top-down political imperialism. They know that more traditionally in a world history class, you would just talk about like, how did the English govern? How did the French govern? So on and so forth. And we're not really concerned about that as much. What we're concerned about is imperialism, but we're really thinking about what are the rationales for imperialism? Like how did these European, these American and Japanese empires justify subjugating other parts of the world? And also what was the impact and what was the interaction with the people that were already there? So you wanna also talk about resistance and rebellions. And there's a lot of really fascinating ones that kids have probably never learned about. And I say that because before I taught AP World, I had never learned about them either. So getting kids to understand that like, when you set up an empire, the whole point is like the people that are living there don't go away. That's the whole point. They get incorporated in some way into that empire. And so just like we've been talking about before with syncretism and cultural diffusion, that same thing is happening here, but really on a global scale. You are gonna talk about economic spheres of influence and imperialism, and then also migrations, but that's a relatively easy one. It's something they, they kind of figure out pretty quickly. So what are the most important things in this unit? The first is understanding how industrialization leads to imperialism and then imperialism fuels industrialization, right? I sometimes even just draw that on the board of really understanding like how do these things fuel each other? It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg sort of thing, right? Um, which came first because some people will say, well, imperialism, because like they had the American colonies before they had the steam engine. But then others will say, well, no, but really they only got there because they were starting to industrialize. I don't know. The second is how are states justifying imperialism? I'm gonna give you a little, kind of a lesson example in a second. And the third, again, is how are indigenous people and states responding? There's a wide variety of responses. Some people choose to adapt and westernize like Japan or the Ottomans with the Tanzimat reforms, for example. Some Latin American states do. They basically accept that they're gonna become part of the US economic sphere of influence, whether they want to or not. Other states are gonna culturally resist. Um, we'll see a lot of really interesting indigenous movements like the ghost dance movement in the American Midwest. And then other states violently resist. And some successfully, you gotta talk about Ethiopia because like they did it. They they stayed independent. They defeated Italy in a war, you know, when, when Italy, at the end of the 1800s, it's very impressive. Okay, what are my favorite lessons? Really my favorite lesson here is a PowerPoint that I have that's on my website, antisocialstudies.org called Imperialism or Social Darwinism Through Literature. Now, clearly this is talking about really sensitive topics. You're talking about race, but you're not just talking about race. You're, you're in, the whole point of this lesson is to show kids racist depictions of people of color. Like that's the whole point of this lesson. And so you really wanna make sure that you've built up a good relationship with your kids and also that you preface this with some conversations. Um, so I, a lot of times, let them know a day in advance. Hey, by the way, next class, here's what we're we'll talking about. And we, I kind of generally preview for them, just talking to them about what we're gonna see. And that way students, especially my students of color, if they're like, mm, 
I already know this stuff. Generally, I'm going to go to the library and work. I say, that's totally fine. Just make sure you're reading this part in the book. Um, but I will really encourage you, especially if you are teaching at a predominantly white school like I am, this is a conversation we have to have, right? We have to talk about like, where does white supremacy come from? Where do these ideas about people of color being air quotes here, inferior, where do all these things come from? And obviously they don't just come from the 1800s, but this is when we really see them in action. Um, and so again, this PowerPoint just walks kids through. We look at poems, we look at um, advertising from the late 19th century, we look at political cartoons, we look at short stories. There's a really great one by George Orwell called Shooting an Elephant in Burma that's super interesting. And we just talk about like, where did this justification come and why did Europeans, US Americans and Japanese people, why did they feel so justified in subjugating other people? Because the thing that your kids are gonna have to understand and it's hard for them to understand is that a lot of those people really genuinely believed they were doing something good. And yet when we look at it now, it was so terrible, right? The other topic that I just really love talking about is Chinese responses to imperialism, basically like the opium wars and on, because China just like loses its mind. It's really fascinating from a world history perspective because China has been our super stable, like go-to person for thousands of years. And so now is the time when you can really talk to your kids about like, what are the problems with stability, right? If you're a super stable country that has this really, really uniform kind of Confucian ethical system, and it's all sort of been op operating for thousands of years, that also makes it difficult to adapt. It makes it difficult to change course really quickly, which like Japan's gonna be able to do way better, or even the Ottomans are gonna be able to do better. And so I really love talking about this, partly because I took a class in grad school on it, so it's super fascinating. Um, I will just say, be aware, kids get so confused by this. They get so confused by like opium wars versus Taiping rebellion versus self-strengthening movement versus the Boxer rebellion. It's very confusing. So make sure that you're clarifying it for them, especially if you use the AMSCO textbook because the AMSCO book for all of its great things, it kind of jumps around chronologically. So this especially gets really confusing. But also I'm gonna make a YouTube video all about it because every year that's the like era and time that the most kids ask me about, so. You're welcome. So what skills go well with this unit? The first is contextualization. Uh, you can go kind of straightforward, just how does industrialization and the enlightenment, the scientific revolution and political revolutions, yada, 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 how does that lead to this global dominance in the age of imperialism? But I also really like talking to kids about the bigger context. Unit six is a great opportunity to stop and do a little bit of big picture review as well. Depending on when you are in the year, this comes at a really nice time because you can step back and talk about like in every era, who were the dominant civilizations, right? You can go all the way back to unit one and you can talk about Silk Road states and you can talk about the Mongols and what made them great. Why were they so dominant? What did they use? And you can do some reviewing, right? Because one of the themes of this course is like, how do states gain and maintain power? And I've we've been talking about this for the whole year. I know I've been talking about it with my kids. And so now is a really good time to say that you're not gonna be reading anything new. Right, these imperial states from Europe, the United States, Japan, like they're not doing anything entirely new. What they're doing is they're just adapting it for their own situation. And so it can be a really nice way to draw some comparisons about um, how states have always maintained power, but also then like what's different now. The other thing that I think is a really interesting conversation is when you talk about the different states and their responses to imperialism, right? So for me, a lot of times I talk about kind of the big Four, I talk about the Ottomans, China, Japan, and Russia, and we kind of grade them. Like who did, who responded really successfully to Westernization, industrialization? The clear answer there is Japan with the Meiji Restoration. Who did okay, but maybe didn't adapt as much as they should? That's sort of Russia and the Ottomans. And then who failed? And that's China, sorry, China. And so you can have that conversation, but I think it's also interesting to step back and contextualize like, why did China fail where Japan succeeded? Why are Russia and the Ottomans more likely to adapt? Well, just geographically, right? They're closer to Europe. Japan's an island, like they're sort of like England. They have to figure out some other way. Whereas China sort of gets screwed over by its stability. Like it's Confucian, um, you know, centuries old traditions 
just make them not as open to new ideas, especially considering that when you're talking about global trade, everyone's always wanted to go to China. So again, this unit is really good for context about really starting to wrap these other things together of like, hey, remember how we talked about the Song Dynasty? <laughs> that has an impact now, right? The other thing that you really just kind of have to do during this unit is cartoon analysis because political cartoons are going to show up on the AP exam. They always do. And this era is really the height, this era through kind of unit seven. And so make sure that you're showing your kids a lot of political cartoons and that you're really talking to your kids about how to analyze them. I will say I'm not a fan of like the super detailed, you know, eight step method to analyze a political cartoon, but I do think you need to walk them through like, what are you looking for? Right. And so what I really have my kids do if I want them to really get a political cartoon is I'll have them start with a minute or two of just describing what they see. Sometimes I'll even have them sketch it like you're not allowed to make any sort of determination about what something means or symbolizes. You are just describing like I see an eagle and it has a flag in its beak and it is going over an island like whatever and then say, OK, what is this saying about this time period? Right. So I don't have like this foolproof, you know, eight step program or whatever but I just show them a ton of political cartoons and we just talk about them over and over again. I don't think that's very helpful, but that's what I do. Uh, what goes wrong in this unit? I mean, it's sort of the same things that went wrong in the actual era, which is Eurocentrism. Like it is really tempting to oversimplify this era and just be like, Europe conquered the world. Because I mean, they kind of did, but AP world is about complexity and AP world is also about the whole world. And so we all have to fight that instinct. And I just say that because I know like I have tons of lessons on the scramble for Africa. I have like a five day simulation on it. I have short stories by George Orwell that I love to sit down and read with the kids. But I've had to accept and, and I'm happy to sort of sacrifice some of those things to say, actually, I'm going to spend a whole day on the Tanzimat reforms, right? Or I'm going to spend a whole day talking about failed uh, violent responses to imperialism in Africa, because those are the types of things that students don't hear about. And especially since we are reaching the era in world history where it's the height of racist nationalism, right? And just really problematic um, interactions between different races and really terrible atrocities being committed against minorities. Like, now is the time to make sure that we're giving them back their agency and saying like all these people resisted this they did not want to be taken over by europe or by japan or by the united states and here are the different ways some of it's cultural some of it's economic some of it's violent um but i think that's a really important message okay uh i hope that's helpful good luck with unit six it's so fun and by that i mean it's so dark but i love that's all i talk about in history so this is sort of like my time to shine if you will um, please make sure that you're subscribed to my YouTube channel so that you can see the videos that are coming out. Um, go check out my Instagram at Antisocial Studies. And also, if you really like the content I'm creating, I do it all for free. I'm just like in my guest room. I don't have a team or anything. So go to patreon.com slash antisocialstudies and you can join just to show me your support. So thanks so much. Good luck.